Welcome to the eighth lecture for regulatory frameworks for environmental management and planning. In today's lecture, we're moving on to look at nature conservation and vegetation management. So re you recall last week we talked about environmental harm and pollution. Uh, so this is uh, one of a series of special topics um, within the overall framework. Next week we'll talk about water management, fisheries and cultural heritage. So in this lecture we're going to look at two problems. One involves clearing in a national park and a criminal prosecution of a fellow named Boyle. So R.V. Boyle is, in um, lawyers' terms, the Crown or the um, state government, uh, the state of Queensland, against um, Boyle being the defendant. And then I'm also going to look at, um, so national parks are an important part of our nature conservation framework, but um, they're only about 5% of the state. So outside of national parks, um, Biodiversity is protected in, under a range of laws, including important laws regulating the clearing of vegetation. So we'll look at um, a cattle station, the Kaiba Cattle Station and proposed clearing, and look at the outside national parks frameworks. And we're going to use those two problems to ask the overall question, do the proposed activities comply with the law? And if not, what steps need to be taken to make them comply? And Within that, we'll look at the Nature Conservation Act, the Vegetation Management Act slash the Sustainable Planning Act, because what we'll see is the Vegetation Management Act is a ghost act. It doesn't um, create approval requirements itself. It's integrated into the IDAS system that we've already talked about. So we understand it in the context of basically being an um, IDAS trigger that requires assessment under that process. Um, I also talk about there were some changes made by the previous state government to the Vegetation Management Act regime in 2012 and 2013 and at the moment there's quite a heated public debate occurring because the current state government is proposing to rewind the changes that were made under the previous government. So I'll talk briefly about those. And within that context we'll ask, well, um, are any applications needed to gain government approval for these two activities, clearing in a national park and clearing on um, for a cattle station on leasehold land, so outside of the national parks framework? And then are the applications likely to be granted? So similar questions that we've asked in earlier lectures for different activities. Okay, can I just make a preliminary point? Both of the examples that I'm using today involve farmers and clearing, and I just should be obvious, but I don't intend this lecture as an attack on farmers, and farmers are in massively important land managers, sorry, farmers are massively important land managers, uh, and their work feeds us all, um, and we want them to prosper. So um, I'm just using two examples though, um, both of them from farming, and I want, want that point to be clear. Following on from that, farmers have a legitimate right to use their land in accordance with the law, but conversely, just as other landholders are constrained by the law, such as planning controls, farmers are also subject to controls on land use. So sometimes in the um, rural sector you see the sort of attitude that, you know, it's my land, I can do what I want with it. Well, just as someone in the city can't just build a 50-storey building because it's their land and they can do what they want with it. You can't do that. You have to comply with the planning scheme. Similarly, farmers have to also comply with relevant laws about the use of their land and you just can't chop down everything and you know, pollute local waterways and um, yeah, you, you can't do that on your land. So you're subject to the law just as everyone else is. And I want you to remember also the points that I made in a handout I gave you way back in lecture one. Um, about four key assumptions that underpin environmental policy in Queensland and Australia. So we want our society to prosper and to achieve this we need to maintain a healthy environment. And regulation and law is important for maintaining a healthy environment but it's not the only means and we use it sparingly and equitably. That's important because people who are on the land often, you know, it's bloody tough often being a farmer. You've got to get up, you got to be working all weathers, you know, you're isolated. It's hard. 
And the sort of people that do that job are going to be tough and they're going to be um, people that you know are very uh, individual, they're not going to like being told what to do, how to manage their land. So there's that, the politics of managing their land, you need them on side or at least you need them to accept the controls on their land and to abide by them. And it, you need to be um, use regulation sparingly and equitably. It's not just going in and, you know, stomping all over people. Uh, it's important to engage them. So another point, we want regulation law to be effective, uh, efficient and equitable, as fair as possible. We want it to have community and political support and we avoid regulation where possible. And that's particularly important in areas like vegetation management, where landholders get incensed um, about government controls. And we also accept the paradigm of capitalism in the sense of a mixed economy where markets, private property, profits and regulation all play key roles. So private property has an important role to play in our system. And this lecture is, I wanted just to frame it in that context, that it's not just about the law constraining what people do. The law has to be equitable, it has to engage the community, it has to have community support. If the law doesn't have community support, then you get a change of government and they do just like the LNP government did, they come in with their ideological blinkers and they change the law and you end up going backwards. Okay, a second preliminary point that I really want to emphasise is that I'm focusing on the Nature Conservation Act and vegetation laws in this lecture and I've, the topic of the um, lecture is nature conservation. But I really want to emphasise that nature conservation is regulated under many acts and not just the ones we're going to talk about today. It's in the entire framework. Because if you think about, say, something like climate change, for instance, and how it's been regulated either under, you know, previously the carbon price or the international framework um, addressing it and whatever measures Australia takes to to respond to climate change, that's going to have huge impacts on biodiversity and nature conservation. So you can't just, it's not just this discrete bundle, but I want to pull out a couple of important acts, but emphasise that it's, they're part of an overall framework. So the planning framework that you're considering for your group assignment, you know that there's important um, environmental issues associated with the vegetation on the land, the creeks, and it's part, so the planning approval and what you do with that land is all part of the overall framework that protects or doesn't protect biodiversity. And the reality is presently we know that biodiversity is being lost. Uh, we know that um, our overall framework is not being effective in conserving biodiversity. Still, it's there and you have to work with what's there. Okay, I just wanted to use as an example of that um, point about the overall framework, um, the example of fire ants. So fire ants, uh, you might know, uh, they're native to South America. Um, they're very small, so you can see them here on that key to give you an idea of scale and that close up on the left. And they were first detected in Brisbane in February 2001. They pose a serious, serious is an understatement, they're a catas catastrophe for Australia if these things don't get eradicated. Um, and they basically they swarm to attack and they sting repeatedly. So victims may feel as if their body is on fire, which is hence the fire ants' um, common name. They're voracious feeders and they can displace or harm native um, wildlife and agricultural animals and destroy entire ecosystems. So these ants have been declared a notifiable pest under the Plant Protection Act, which I'm not talking about in this lecture beyond this small example. It's administered by Biosecurity Queensland. And um, this is the red imported fire ant restricted area in 2012. So you can see UQ I've marked there. And basically the, the red area and then the orange around it are areas. The red area is the high risk area. And then the low risk zone is the area around it, so a buffer. And then this is what it changed to in 2014. So I'll just go back. So this was 2012. And that's what, in 2014, you can see the red areas have moved quite a bit south. And then um, last year, UQ, um, fire ants were detected on UQ and there was a fire ant restricted area declared in l January last year. They were, I think they were detected on the Cricket Oval, uh, is that Oval 8? I can't remember what that field is over there. You know the one, 
down at the southern end of UQ. You know, I think that's where they were detected. And so basically they set up these restricted areas in, and they try to eradicate them within it, but also there's controls on moving things like pot plants and anything that can contain fire ants so that they don't just basically um, move when people move earth or anything within, you know, outside that area. So there's been a huge effort. And um, there's, been a separate, there's been separate outbreaks of um, fire ants in other parts of Australia. Um, in 2014, there was an outbreak in Sydney um, around Port of Botany. So they are coming in um, in shipping containers, basically. So from South America or areas where they, their infestations are. And so the, the outbreak in Sydney is um, different to the one in Brisbane. They haven't just moved from Brisbane down to Sydney. They came, they've done genetic studies to, to show that they're actually two different infestations. And yeah, around the Port of Botany, and there's, similarly there's been this declared area around Port of Botany and they're trying to control it down there. But basically they could spread hugely. Um, uh, this is an article, Ants from Hell are Devouring America. Um, and this is the spread of fire ants since the 1930s. Um, so you can see they basically started down here. Is that Louisiana? Louisiana, down there, I'll make it. So mouth of the Mississippi, just coming out here. So that's where they originally um, arrived in 2001. Sorry. No, I've got that the wrong way around, haven't I? So 1931 is this, um, and then they're spread in 1958, spreading out. And then out to 2001 must be these little ones up here, and plus these must be different different infestations where they've been detected as well. So continuing to spread, and then that um, hatched area here is the area that they think that they could spread to. And so basically, they dramatically change the, has anyone been to those areas and been, has anyone been bitten by fire ants? No, well, okay. And what's it feel like? Not great. Not great, so were you bitten by one or a lot? Two or three, okay, and you've been bitten by fire ants as well? No? Okay, well, uh, it's the sort of thing like, imagine having a picnic and these ants just swarm over and they just sting repeatedly en masse. Um, and so small children, um, but also birds and everything, they just basically will go into a nest and kill everything in it. So anything basically on the ground and then they eat, you know, the things that they've killed. So apart from humans, it's, yeah, a tremendous threat to wildlife. So they're, they're bloody awful, horrible. Um, and they're originally from South America um, and yeah. So that's just a different part of the biodiversity conservation picture. And I'm not going to cover every aspect of it, but I just really want to emphasize that it's actually the entire framework of laws that um, contribute to biodiversity conservation, not just what I'm talking about today. So in that context, let's look at these couple of problems. So the first one we'll look at is clearing in a national park. And as I said, um, the Crown and Boyle, a lawyer would call the R is, stands for Regina, so the Crown, we've currently got a Queen. So a criminal prosecution is typically R and then the V, um, Boyle. Um, and a lawyer would say that as the Crown and Boyle. So I'm gonna play you a bit a few clips. Um, one's from Channel 7, um, one from Today Tonight, and the EPA, when it was the EPA, um, gave me some videos as well. And I'll just see if they'll play. A Darling Downs landowner has pleaded guilty to clearing about 13 hectares of World Heritage listed National Park. The grazier has offered to hand over some of his own land to escape a jail term. In 2001, Vincent Boyle bulldozed 14,000 trees in Main Range National Park near Warwick to connect two parcels of his land for cattle grazing. Two years later, bushwalkers discovered the clearing roughly the size of 26 football fields. The farmer had erected barbed wire fences and even sown the land with pasture seed. The impacts relate to loss of habitat for rare and threatened species, which made the area so important. The area was declared a national park in 
1994. It was World Heritage listed the following year. Brisbane's district court heard six threatened or endangered species have been severely impacted. These rainforests are significant on a world scale. They are comparable to the reefs in the Great Barrier Reef, to the sand dunes on Fraser Island. At the time, the 76-year-old pleaded ignorance, but the court heard he knew he was clearing outside his boundary lines and hadn't sought any permits. Yes, I do. It's estimated reforestation will take six years and cost more than $400,000. The offence carries a maximum penalty of two years jail, but in a deal struck outside the courtroom, Boyle could avoid a custodial sentence. Pending the court's approval, the deal would see Boyle hand over 430 hectares of his land to extend the Main Range National Park. The sentencing judge reserved his decision until next week. Angela Cox, 7 News. At South East Queen... I'm just going to go on. There was another clip that ABC had given me for um, basically the same news report. So how are those lights for you guys? Is that a bit too low? Is that better? Okay, let's just unpack that uh, a bit and we'll go on because you'll see there's a second chapter to this story. Um, the land is located near Warwick, so it's about 200 kilometres southwest of Brisbane. You can see in this red circle, just over the Great Dividing Range. So we focus in on that area and I'm going to focus in again on this red circle. You can see here um, the areas, that, obvious areas that have been cleared and areas that haven't been cleared and typically those boundaries reflect national parks. So everything outside of national parks completely cleared. So I'm a really keen bushwalker and I find it it's pretty hard bushwalking out in this area because you know when you, you peer out from this you know wonderful national park and you just look at the amount of land degradation in these areas, just gullies that are all eroded and cattle, it's really sad. Um, but focusing in on this red circle you can see Main Range National Park there um, and there's a, obviously a property to the north and then the area that was cleared is in that red circle and I'll focus in a bit on that. So Boyle's, Boyle actually had land beside the National Park, those two bits and the area um, that he cleared was basically what I've marked there. So basically he was joining two paddocks uh, and notice how there's all these that big black area just here, that's um, all cliff lines. So I'll show you some footage of that in a second. Okay, this is a map that the, I call it the EPA, it was the Environmental Protection Agency before it became the Department of Environment and Heritage Protection. So EPA when they prosecuted Boyle prepared this map to go to court to explain what Boyle had done. So you've got the boundaries there of the National Park and you've got his land here and his land here. And we know that there's cliffs around here. So he's joining his bits of land um, and yeah, basically clearing um, all along through the National Park. So. Um, I want to just play a bit of aerial footage. This is taken by the EPA. This is the land that you're seeing there is that um, bit to the east and this is the bit in the National Park that you can see that bit that's cleared. That's the um, area in the National Park that was cleared looking straight down on it now. So EPA took this footage as part of the prosecution. You can see the one remaining tree. And then we come and then you'll see these cliffs spring up So amazing country and I'll come back to that bit of footage there because there's a second, as I say, there's a second part to this story. So to avoid jail, because that's what he was looking at, this is uh, a really serious offence, to avoid jail, um, Boyle proposed to donate some other land um, that he had um, that was um, adjacent to the National Park, he proposed to donate it. Um, and um, the sentencing judge took that into account in, in not sentencing to jail. 
but um, it's the sort of time frame was, I remember going along to the trial, I wasn't a, a lawyer involved in the trial, but I went along to the sentencing because it was a really interesting case. And um, Boyle, let's say the first sentencing occurred in November of 2001. Well, Boyle um, offered to hand over his land, but it would take a few months before the transfer actually occurred. So he got sentenced, say, in November 2001, but the land that he was going to transfer was going to be transferred in, say, April 2002. In the interim, it was still Boyle's land, and what he did after being avoiding jail and agreeing to donate this land was he sent in um, timber getters to basically take all of the timber off the land that he was donating to the National Park. And so the EPA learned about that and obviously they were very unhappy. And so they went out to the, um, the National Park and took footage of it and tried to reopen the sentencing. And There's a wealthy farmer who bulldozed a World Heritage Park but avoided jail because he donated land worth more than $400,000 as punishment. But he didn't stop there. No sooner did he walk out of court than he went back to the National Park and started tearing down more trees. Vince Boyle agreed to give his side of the story to Chris Allen. I did not know it was National Park. I thought I was clearing my own land. Genuinely? Genuinely my own land, yes, for sure. Defending himself for the first time, farmer Vince Boyle says he didn't know the 14,000 trees he bulldozed were in a national park. For sure, I never did, never. No, look, it probably cost me, to clear that 13 hectares, it probably cost me $100,000. Do you think I'd be silly enough to spend $100,000 to clear land that I didn't own? Like, it's just so stupid. I think the courts will decide whether that's a fair excuse or not. Uh, who knows whether he knew it or not. Most land, uh, landowners would know what their property is. Green spokesman Howard Nielsen says Vince is nothing but an environmental vandal. The way we would see it is that not only has he disregarded the, the law in terms of the uh, heritage listing, but he's disregarded the community, basically, and certainly the, uh, the natural balance of things. That's all your land up to the top of the hill there, Pat. What are you going to say there, yes? Yeah. From the skyline there. A wealthy landowner, Vince could have been jailed for two years for what he did. Instead, Vince's lawyers negotiated a deal whereby he paid a fine and agreed to give the state 430 hectares of his own land as compensation. We see jail as an appropriate punishment when people damage valuable assets like national parks. Solicitor Joe Bragg from the Environmental Defender's Office says Vince got off lightly because it'll cost taxpayers $400,000 and take six years to rehabilitate the land he wrecked. Well, he certainly was very fortunate that he had something to trade to try and escape jail, and for poorer people that's certainly unfair. Well, he's not a pedophile, he's not a drug dealer. Vince's wife, Anne, says jailing her husband would be unfair. Well, I don't want him in jail, that's all. I, I mean, I don't know whether the judge made the right decision. I don't know. I just, and I don't want him in jail at his age. With six threatened and endangered species impacted by the clearing, Terry Harper from the Environmental Protection Agency says Vince mustn't understand the crime he's committed. These rainforests are significant on a world scale. They are comparable to the reefs in the Great Barrier Reef, to the sand dunes on Fraser Island. They have said that land would, t would cost $400,000 to replant it, which is just 10 times more than the cost would ever be. On top of that, we've, they said we've killed birds and frogs worth $9,000 each. So I don't know how they come up with that. If the frogs are worth nine thousand dollars each, I would like to, I would like to get someone that could breed them and we could sell them for that. But the story doesn't end there. After Vince had done this deal to swap his land and avoid going to jail, the Environmental Protection Agency found out, much to its horror, that the land he was swapping had also been partially cleared. It appeared Vince had done it again. <laughs> We haven't cleared at all, we've only cut timber, cut logs. Once you donated it though, or? No, before. 
I can say that the Greens would uh, would certainly want the court to take the strongest possible action against people who have done the sort of things that uh, Boyle's alleged to have done. I have not gone and cleared land that I've given him, have not. Maybe so, but now Vince has to face court again over the whole mess. And once again, he's looking at a possible jail term. Well, I think they, they might be using me as a, as, a, as a guinea pig, I don't know, but I think they, I don't know why, but I think they want to see me in jail. And if, I, if that's the case, well, we'll have to bear it. And, and you're saying you might deserve to go? I don't deserve to go, but I'm not, I'm not the judge. <laughs> OK, don't you love the little do -do from the Today Tonight? How did he come to own land inside the National Park, sir? How, great question. How did he come to own land in the National Park to start with? He didn't. So he owned land around the National Park. He just, um, he was going to donate it, so he boarded the National Park. So, does that? So anyway, um, this is a, um, I have very little to do with the Crew Mail, um, but this is the front page of the Crew Mail at the time. Sly logging, not enough to land Grazier in jail. Um, so front page. Um, And I just wanted to... show you the... Um, video of the EPA aerial again, because so, it goes to... So, Boyle said he hadn't cleared um, the um, land that he donated. Um, so this is the land that was cleared originally, I'll just replay it, and it comes through to footage. So this is the first clearing, and I'll just let it play, it only goes for a second. Um, so this clearing was found by bushwalkers. Um, now, um, yeah, they just basically wandered across it and thought, hang on, this is supposed to be in the National Park, and they notified the EPA. Most of this stuff and, um, would now be picked up by satellites. Um, at the time, though, it was bushwalkers that just happened to come across it and realise it should have, that was part of the National Park and it had been cleared and what the hell was going on. OK, this is the land that he's donated. So this is after he's donated it, and this is footage taken by the EPA basically walking around on the land. Now, he said, no, he hadn't cleared it after he donated it, but... Um, you know, this looks fairly recent, and I don't know what that bulldozer is doing there, but it must have just snuck in in the middle of the night when he wasn't looking, and, you know, who knows how it got there. Um, so, yeah, this is what was going on after he... Now, technically, he might, he might be meaning that he hasn't actually donated it at that point, and which was true. He'd agreed to donate it, but the paperwork... Um, was going to take a few months for it actually to be transferred into the National Park. So this is still while he te technically owns it, but after he has been sentenced on the basis that this land will be donated um, to a National Park and that it was pristine and basically worthy of National Park status. So, yeah. Now, what do you reckon is going on here? Why... He's obviously well off. Why has he gone in and taken this timber out on this land that he's donated? Surely he must have realised that... EPA wasn't going to be happy about it. What do you reckon's going on? Is it, yeah, it's a bit about profit, but do you think it's the money that's actually, I'm sure he's going to make, let's just say he's going to make some money from this. But really, why do you think he's doing this? Yet yeah, he's owns the land and he should be able to do whatever he wants with it. That's partially it, but I reckon it goes further than that because now he's agreed to donate it. Just like towards the EPA, let's like just raise that up a few notches in terms of emotional spite, revenge. He's telling him to basically go and, you know, take a you know, I won't use the words that I might use them. But here's some of the timber that he's pulling out, okay? This is all after the sentencing, all on this land that he's donated. So, um, yeah, so spite basically telling the, you know, basically he's wanting to say to the EPA, like, fuck off, you assholes. That's what he's doing. 
Um, so that's that example. And let's just look at, um, so that was that example. Um, let's, yeah, there was, in the Newman years, grazing was allowed in national parks. Um, so this was um, back from last year. There were, basically, there was, there was a contra controversial policy during the drought to allow grazing in national parks. But generally, national parks are about the conservation of nature exclusively. Yes? Sorry, what ended up happening to that case? Like, did you get prosecuted? To Boyle? Yeah. Yep, okay, we'll come through to that at the oh. end. And yes, he was prosecuted, and yes, he was fined. He ultimately didn't go to jail, though. The EPR on the second time around did want to have him sent to jail, but basically the judge just reopened the sentencing because technically the clearing in the national parks he'd already been sentenced for and courts are very reluctant to reopen sentencing after the sentence has been imposed and the clearing that was occurring on the land that he had donated was actually was his land and he wasn't actually clearing, he was taking out timber. So he could do it as part of an ongoing timber operation. So what he was doing was technically lawful and so they reopened the sentencing though to um, basically have some further consideration of the fact that the land wasn't pristine and yeah, they did stop it. They put a, there's an, uh, an order that can be made under the Nature Conservation Act to do something um, to conserve nature, it's called a um, nature conservation order. I think it's a nature conservation order, yeah. Um, and basically they imposed that on him to stop the clearing once they found out about it. Okay, so that's within a national park. Outside of national parks, which so national parks are in about 5% of the state, the um, management of vegetation is very, very important for biodiversity conservation and other things like water quality and the like. So clearing outside of national parks is um, an important uh, component of the overall biodiversity conservation within Queensland. Let's look at um, a cattle station, the Kyber Cattle Station, which is located about 700 kilometres west, northwest of um, here, you can see it marked there, out near Augathella. And if we just focus in, there's the Kyber cattle station. You can see those rivers flowing south, the Neve and the Warrigo River, which go into the Murray-Darling Basin. And just gonna focus in, obviously, on that red circle. So this is the um, Kyber cattle station, um, and the real property description is lot 1884 on PH 204, and it's leasehold land. So it's owned by the state, but it's a pastoral lease. So. Um, it's been run as a cattle property. And you can see there that there's been significant um, clearing um, of the west and southwest sections. And then basically in the northeast section, north and northeast, there hasn't been much clearing. So this, um, I'm just focusing on a couple of um, aspects of it. So A, B and C. So if we just look at A, um, you can see there there's a homestead and the big paddocks and there's a significant amount of vegetation being retained in pockets, but all these little lines that are basically they've pulled the timber down and they rake them together and they normally just burn along it. So um, a lot of clearing has already occurred. And this is that B. So you can see down there a pocket of still vegetated land. And then up in the northern section, you can just see all the lines for paddocks and little fragments here. So this is a real, you know, a real working property. There are bits that are cleared, there are bits that are uncleared. And so the ongoing management of that by the state, in, you know, you have to deal with the reality of what's there. And this, um, if we look at the property, um, so it's a cattle station. It's about 28,000 hectares in area and it's leasehold land. And here's, let's just say that this is the proposal to clear. So those green, sorry, not green, blue hatched areas. So proposal from the landholder to clear that. Um, and it, that's 3,727 hectares of the property. But obviously, you know, large bits of the property over here have already been cleared. So there's the landholder is clearing basically big chunks of what's left. Um, and I might just also explain, this example comes from uh, a court case that I was involved in in 2006. 
um, where I acted for the Minister for Natural Resources who was defending uh, an action by the landholder who wanted to clear this land. So I acted for the Minister in, yeah, in, it was in the phase out of broad scale land clearing. And, yeah, and basically the Minister had said it shouldn't be allowed to be cleared. Okay, so that's our two problems, one in a national park, one outside. Um, do the proposed activities comply with the law, and if not, what steps need to be taken to make them comply? So what laws regulate these activities? Um, as I said, there's many laws that regulate nature conservation. Um, I'll focus on state laws, and for the clearing in national parks, uh, in this diagram we've looked at um, before, I don't think we've got the right pointer option there. Pen. So there's the Nature Conservation Act, as well as um, the Vegetation. So the Nature Conservation Act is within protected areas. Vegetation Management Act outside, but as I, as I said um, in the introduction, it's the VMA is a ghost act, and it's linked to the Sustainable Planning Act that we've already talked about. Okay, there's a lot of laws that regulate vegetation um, management and nature conservation, but I've, in the appendix to my synopsis book that um, I've put online um, and referred you to as a reference, so um, I've put a table there of different um, things that regulate vegetation. So the top ones are the sort of VMA spa triggers, and then there's a whole range of other things like marine plants, riparian vegetation, um, if you're in the wet tropics, et cetera, um, and if they're weeds and all that sort of stuff. So it's, the table's just there as a summary of all these different things that regulate vegetation. But if we go back to this diagram that I've also um, given you before and just think about it, the main Queensland state laws regulating onshore development within national parks, remember it's the Nature Conservation Act, and outside of national parks, if we're clearing for the Kyber cattle station, it's not mining, so we cut out that regime um, and we're basically under the Sustainable Planning Act. So just remember that basic split and that's a, a good um, thing to bear in mind for overall um, parts of the framework. So if we looked at the Nature Conservation Act, I could download it, we could go through it, you know, the structure and the like, um, like I suggested you do for understanding um, legislation or statutory interpretation. But if I just pull out some key sections, let's say we've done that, we've downloaded it, we come to section 62, which um, makes it an offence um, to um, a person other than an authorised person, so like a National Parks officer, must not take use, keep or interfere with the cultural or natural resource of a protected area other than under, and there's a series of exceptions, for instance, a licence or a permit. Um, Boyle had none of those. Let's just say none of the exemptions applied. So take, use, um, keep or interfere with any cultural or natural resource. And take is widely defined to include kill, cut down, clear. So the clearing of the National Park was taking um, of natural resources within the National Park. So you've got an offence there. And there's a penalty of 3,000 penalty units or two years imprisonment. So um, EPA was looking for a um, sentence of imprisonment the second time around. So that's the Nature Conservation Act. Basically everything in a National Park is protected, whether it's dead or alive. You shouldn't interfere with it or take it. Now, national parks have said only cover a relatively small part of the state. This is just a, a map of, you can see all the green little patches are protected areas or national parks. Um, and it also includes, obviously, we've got the Great Barrier Reef, which is a multiple use um, protected area. Some parts of it are totally protected. You can't fish in them, the green zones, that, um, and, and they've been raised to 33% of the um, Great Barrier Reef Marine Park you can't fish in, um, but there's big sections of the Great Barrier Reef obviously that you can fish in, including trawling and the like. So it's a protected area, but it's a multiple use protected area and um, it does allow fishing in the majority of it. Okay, that's within a national park and we could say, well, Boyle's got a problem with section 62. 
Outside of national parks, though, the Nature Conservation Act also protects um, protected animals and um, protected plants. So section 88, um, this, it says this section is subject to section 93, which is about indigenous um, take. So uh, let's just say um, boil, well, this section wouldn't apply to boil, it's section 62 which would apply to him, but for the Kyber cattle property, um, let's just say it's not a, they're not traditional owners, um, it's a um, non-traditional um, owner application, so section 93 completely irrelevant. Um, and doesn't apply to the taking of protected animals in a protected area because section 62 of the Act is relevant for that. And then it says, a person must not take a protected animal unless the person is an authorised person or the taking is authorised under this Act. And then it sets up a series of offences of classes. You don't need to worry about the classes, but basically must not take a protected animal and take, again, is widely defined in the Act to include kill, trap, snare, injure, harm. It's got this big long, every sort of word that you could think of, including kill. Um, but also including, um, uh, yeah, well, take very wide definition. Protected animal, there's also in section 89, there's a corresponding one for protected plants. Um, unless the person is an authorised person, so basically a National Parks Officer, um, or otherwise authorised under the Act, um, unless the, or the taking is authorised under this Act. And it's a defence to a charge of taking a protected animal in contravention of subsection one to prove that the taking happened in the course of a lawful activity that was not directed towards the taking and the taking could not have been reasonably avoided. Um, let's just unpack that a little bit. Um, I'll open up. Just to show you how the act works. So, under the Nature Conservation Act, we've got um, a regulation which creates um, lists of protected animals. So um, if you go to the, there's a number of different regulations. Um, so this is the Nature Conservation Wildlife Regulation. And it lists in Schedule 5, or actually I'll go to the start. So there's a series of classes of protected animals, um, similar to the IUCN um, lists of th um, threatened species, and similar to uh, other um, classes of threatened species that are used at a national level. So we've got um, extinct in the wild, extinct in the wild wildlife in Schedule One. So the paradise parrot, for instance, is listed there. So um, extinct in the wild, and there's a range of mammals the eastern betong, the, the desert rat kangaroo, all of these animals are uh, extinct in the wild and they're included in the classes of protected animals. And then there's endangered wildlife, Schedule 2, so it's sort of going up in less, obviously if you're extinct in the wild that's a really bad thing to be if you're a species. Um, it would mean that you only exist in, in zoos, that's all that's left. Uh, and then there's endangered wildlife, um, which includes a list of amphibians. You can see there the little water full frog. There's a big long list. Birds, the following birds are endangered wildlife. Um, the Regent honey eater, southern cassowary, um, double eyed fig parrot, um, a whole range of birds. Fish, uh, invertebrates. Um, notice there's only a couple of um, butterflies listed. Um, and then mammals and reptiles. So um, some skinks, turtles, um, geckos, uh, and then it goes on to plants as well. So they're endangered and they're all within the, the if you looked at the definition of protected animals, it would include um, animals that are listed in the endangered category. And then Schedule 3 has vulnerable wildlife. And again, there's a list of amphibians, so frogs. Basically, it's easy to get on these lists, um, relatively easy if you're a frog or you're a beautiful butterfly or the like. It's a lot harder if you're a flying fox or something that, or a snake or something that's um, dangerous to humans or eats things that humans like.
So um, if you're a frog or a butterfly and you sneeze, um, you're going to be thrown onto some endangered list. Um, similarly, birds, if you're a cute bird, then you can easily be put on the endangered list. Um, but <laughs> yeah, if you harm humans, um, it's a lot, it gets a lot harder. So we've got birds, you see a whole long list. Okay, and fish, there's a few fish, invertebrates. Um, notice butterflies, you don't get any mosquitoes or any, it's just the pretty butterflies. Uh, and then you go into mammals, sub-Antarctic fur seal. I didn't even know we had them in Queensland. <laughs> Large-eared pied bat. Um, yeah, so bats, easy to get on the endangered list, but not if you're a fruit bat. Um, and then reptiles, we've got some turtles, a few snakes, um, etc. And then plants, so that's vulnerable. And then um, there's a similar list for near-threatened wildlife and least concern wildlife. And this is where they have basically a bucket. So all the higher categories have specific lists. But then um, in Schedule 6, we list entire classes. So um, animals that are least concern wildlife, um, which are also included in the definition of protected animals, an amphibian indigenous to Australia, other than an amphibian that is extinct in the wild, endangered, vulnerable or near threatened wildlife is least concerned wildlife. So obviously that's all of the higher categories you take out and if you're not in a higher category and you're an amphibian indigenous to Australia, then you're a least concerned wildlife, but you're a protected wildlife under this act, under section 88. So every, you know, every frog that's indigenous to Australia is a protected animal. Similarly with birds, every bird indigenous to Australia that's not in one of those higher categories is a protected animal. Um, invertebrates though, you don't get the entire class. There's some specific things, a scorpion in the genus um, Eurydacus, and then a spider in a particular family, and the following butterflies, again. Um, but there's no like entire, like they don't list mosquitoes, so if you kill a mosquito, you're not killing a protected animal because it's not actually listed. Um, but um, there's a few, yeah. All amphibians, all birds. Mammals, a mammal that is indigenous to Australia other than the following is least concerned wildlife. So if it's in one of the higher lists or it's a dingo. Dingoes have been excluded because farmers hate them and want to shoot them and yeah, they're not protected wildlife even though, and there's a debate within the conservation sector about whether they should be protected. They're thought to have come into Australia with um, uh, people moving down from through Papua New Guinea, um, I think it's 12,000 years ago. So um, they were basically brought in as domestic um, pets for, um, or not pets is the wrong word, but you know, domestic animals by um, the Aboriginal people and then have gone wild. So, um, but obviously there's a clash with the farming community and that's why they're not included. But basically any other mammal, so every kangaroo, every Echidna, every you know, every every mammal, um, except dingoes, and if you're not if you're listed and you're not listed in one of the high categories, um, then you are um, a protected animal under this act. Okay, and reptiles again, all reptiles indigenous to Australia are protected animals, and plants as well. So you get these big classes of animals that are all protected under this Act, under Section 88. So in that context, let's just go back to Section 88 and have a think about it. And let's just play, before we have a break, let's just have this little um, discussion about this, this section. So let's just say you, let's say this weekend you decide to go for a drive out to, um, where do you want to go on the weekend? Who, who wants to go up the Sunshine Coast to go to Noosa? Okay, so you, you go up to Noosa, you turn off the highway, you're driving towards Noosa, and a kangaroo, um, let's just say you're bang the speed limit, you're driving along, and a kangaroo leaps out of the bush, and bang, you hit it, and it's killed. Obviously really tragic, you, you stop to check that it's dead, you find that it's been killed. Let's have a think about whether you've broken um, the law. 
um, a person, so you're a person, must not take a protected animal. So the kangaroo is a mammal that's indigenous to Australia, so it's a protected animal. You've killed it, so you've taken it. You're not an authorised person, and let's just say you didn't have any licence under the Act. Okay, so have you committed an offence? Subsection 2, yes, but you have to read the whole subsection. And notice down here, subsection 3, there's a general defence. So down here, it is a defence to a charge of taking a protected animal in contravention of subsection 1 to prove that A, the taking happened in the course of a lawful activity that was not directed towards the taking. So just have a think about what you're doing. You're driving, okay? Let's just say you had your licence, you're obeying the speed limit. So do you meet paragraph A? The taking, the killing of the kangaroo happened in the course of a lawful activity, so the driving was lawful and was not directed towards the taking. So you weren't intending to kill the kangaroo, you were intending to get to Noosa and you're really distraught that this kangaroo was dead. So does everyone agree we meet paragraph A? Yep. And the taking could not have been reasonably avoided. So what more could, you know, in this situation, you're obeying the speed limit, you're driving, do you think there's anything that and it just jumped out? Is there anything more that you could have done? Applying just a community standard, do you think that the taking could not have been reasonably avoided in that context? Who, who agrees that we've got a defence and we meet A and B? Put your hand up if you think we've got a defence. And put your hand up if you don't think we've got a defence. Okay, so no one thinks we don't have a defence here. And yeah, I'd agree. In this sort of um, situation, the law, can you see how the law, it makes basically all Indigenous amphibians, um, uh, mammals, um, birds, they're all protected. But if you're doing something lawful and one of those protected animals happens to be killed and you couldn't have done anything more to avoid it, then you haven't broken the law. Yep? Just on the flip side of that, I guess the other would be if you actually purposely shoot. Yeah, it's a really good example. Um, if you purposely shoot it, can you see how you don't have a defence? Because um, the taking was you, your the taking was um, the lawful activity, um, and you, it was directed towards the taking. You intended to kill it. So if you intend to kill something, which raises some tricky questions in relation to say a snake. Let's just say, because um, I remember when I was a kid. I lived up in North Queensland, we had lots of snakes. And you know, if there was a snake found around the house, you know, Dad would go and get the shotgun and blow its head off. Um, so in that sort of situation, um, have you broken the, have you breached the act? The answer is yes. Would you ever be prosecuted for that? The answer is no. You'd never be, the, you'd never be prosecuted for that sort of activity because it just wouldn't be enforced in that way. But technically, you would have breached the act. Um, if you intended to, if you intended to kill it, and it wasn't a life-threatening situation, so do you see how? Yeah. Kangaroo hunting. I thought that was. Really so kangaroo hunting? Yes, it is. Um, uh, well, the culling or you know the shooting of them for pet food, um, but that those sorts of things where someone's got a wildlife license, um, you can under the Act, under the regulations, you can have. Um, a range of permits, including for, they call it macropod harvesting, macropod being the, the um, kangaroos, and there's a macropod harvesting plan, and it basically allows for licenses to be issued for hunters to go out and shoot kangaroos, and then they chop them up for pet food, generally. Um, so that's authorised under the Nature Conservation Act. Um, but they're specific licences. So you can have specific licences. Similarly, farmers can get damage mitigation permits if there is, you know, animals coming in and feeding on their crops. They can get damage mitigation permits to basically sh either shoo them away or in some cases kill them. So there's a range of permits that can be issued under this Act. Um, but, um, yeah, if you don't have a specific permit, then well, the thing I wanted to draw out was, can you see how the, the Act actually covers a lot of things um, and all of these things are protected, but then the law actually has a fairly 
common sense, you might think, or it's a, the defence is what I'd suggest the community would expect, that the community would not want people to be held in breach of the law if they're just doing something that's lawful and a protected animal happens to be killed accidentally, in effect. So the law reflects community expectations. Does everyone agree? Cool. Okay, it's right on three o'clock. Why don't we take a break on that and we'll come back and we'll keep talking through um, the Nature Conservation Act. So welcome back to the second half of our lecture. Before the break, we were talking about the Nature Conservation Act and I was just working through it. So we're looking at these two problems. One, the clearing within the National Park and we've looked at section 62 of the Nature Conservation Act and we see that that clearly is unlawful. Um, I've gone on to talk about section 88, which deals with protected animals outside of national parks and so we've seen that there are regulations which set up classes of protected animals, but all birds, indigenous to Australia, all mammals, um, all reptiles um, and the like are protected animals under the Act. So there's broad protection. Um, and then we looked at an example of driving a car and um, killing a kangaroo, but not intending to, and we've agreed that there is a defence uh, under the under section 88 so I wanted you to just see the operation of the law in a you might think a common sense way yes what about fish, what about fish? so you'd have to go and look at the classes but no um, there's no general um, protected animals for fish um, there are some specifics um, like in the yeah but fish and invertebrates generally um, there's relatively few protections of them. Uh, and dingoes, yeah, excluded completely. So you don't need to worry about classes, but I'd like you to have a, at least a broad understanding of those protected animals, because then if you're ever working with flora and fauna sort of surveys, these classes of protected animals, of endangered, um, vulnerable and the like, that, this is the legislation at a state level that makes animals protected in different classes. And then at a federal level, we've got the EPBC Act as well, which has um, similar sorts of classes of animals. Okay, um, just a few changes in the last few years to the Nature Conservation Act. So in 2012, there was um, significant changes to the Nature Conservation Act, um, basically trying to um, remove its, change its objects um, and basically commercialise national parks a lot more. And that was under the Newman government and then the current government has, has sought to repeal a lot of those things. So there's been, uh, you might think that national parks should be fully protected and that's right, that's what the law um, has provided for, for decades. So we had our first national parks established over a century ago in Queensland and um, yet there's still ongoing philosophical fights within government um, and pol politics about what should be allowed in national parks and the commercialisation of them. So the previous um, Newman LNP government also cancelled the previous um, SEQ forest agreement which was made in 1999 and basically it was um, an agreement where there would be a phase out of um, forestry outside of plantations so all native forestry would cease over 25 years. So they cancelled that and it hasn't been reinstated. So that was actually also a major part of the biodiversity framework in Queensland. That was cancelled, it hasn't come back. Um, that's, so that's the Nature Conservation Act and I don't want to go into the regulations in a lot of detail. So if you end up working for national parks in this area, you'll get to know the regulations. There's a whole series of them. Um, and they, they require things like licenses if you want to keep native birds. So if you think about it, a native bird, like a black-throated finch, is a, um, comes within the class of protected animals. And if you were to you know, capture it and put it in a cage, you have taken it. So you would be committing an offence under the Act unless you were authorised and you basically you would find that you need to have a licence for um, keeping um, native birds and the range of other native species. So there's a whole licensing system for um, native animals that you want to keep as pets. 
Um, and as well, we mentioned about killing native animals for like macropod harvesting, the culling of, not culling, the killing kangaroos, as well as farmers who can kill native wildlife in certain circumstances under damage mitigation permits. So I was in, involved a decade ago in a whole series of court cases about stopping farmers from electrocuting lots of flying foxes, so fruit growers who'd um, cleared forest and then planted fruit crops and then flying foxes were coming out of the forest and surrounding national parks onto their land and eating their lychees, it was lychees in particular, and um, the farmers were killing them en masse, they'd erected these big electric grids to electrocute them. And um, I'll talk more about that when we talk about the EPBC Act because we big part of the litigation was under the EPBC Act and we sought, an, or on behalf of a conservationist, sought an injunction to stop them killing flying foxes. So um, those, um, yeah, those protections are, are there as well. Um, EPBC Act we'll talk about later, but um, farmers can apply for damage mitigation permits to kill native wildlife. And um, yeah, so there's all this licensing embedded under the Nature Conservation Act. I don't think for our purposes it's, I don't want to take you into the detail of that stuff. If you end up working for National Parks, great, you'll know it in detail. But I mainly want you to know, okay, nature conservation, oh, everything in a national park is protected. Outside of it, protected animals and protected plants are also protected. There's general defence. And so if you're looking at but if you're looking at developing land or something like that, you would be looking at the threatened species on it in the context of, um, say, seeking a, approval under the Sustainable Planning Act for clearing or development. You might look at the threatened species and it's part of the assessment. And if you get a development permit to develop the land, then it will be authorised, the damage that you cause to um, native species will be effectively authorised um, under the uh, whole legal system. Okay, so that's um, Nature Conservation Act. Let's look at the Vegetation Management Act. And as I said, this is a ghost act. It doesn't actually have offence provisions within it. Um, it's integrated into the IDAS system. So if we just set it in context, um, vegetation management has been highly controversial for the last two decades in Queensland. So prior to the 1990s, there was little regulation of vegetation clearing outside of protected areas. So outside of the 5% of the state in protected areas, not only could you just clear what you wanted, but often in the 60s and 70s, leases were granted and the at terms of the lease or conditions of the lease required you to clear the land. So you were required to clear large areas just to keep your lease. So that's prior to the 1990s and then come the 1990s we realised we've got a massive problem with biodiversity loss and a range of other impacts. So there started to be movement to regulate vegetation management and the first big step was in 90, well, in the mid 90s um, some local governments passed um, laws, local laws to try and regulate clearing and that was fairly controversial but local governments were doing it. But it was only the local governments like Brisbane, Sunshine Coast, the, um, you know, none of the local governments through central Queensland were passing those laws. So it was really limited to the large population areas. Then in 1997, there were controls on leasehold land were regulated under the Lands Act. And so a farmer like the people on the Kyber property, so it was pastoral lease, so it would have been regulated in terms of clearing in 1997. And then in um, 2000, the, well in 1999, the BT government passed the Vegetation Management Act and it led to this massive spike in clearing because it was hugely controversial when it came in. Farmers, you, you even see today on the ABC website or in the news, you'll see farmers up in arms because um, the federal labor government um, announced yesterday as part of its climate policy that it was going to regulate at a national level vegetation management. And you'll see stories about Ag Force presidents saying this is outrageous and they shouldn't get involved. And um, so that's, that's just the tip of like hostility to regulation of vegetation management. Back in, in um, 1999, it was red hot. There was huge um, concern from the um, farming community about moves to regulate 
um, vegetation clearing, um, not just on leasehold land but on freehold land. So the 30% of the state that's privately owned was also going to be regulated. So that was under the Vegetation Management Act slash, at the time it was the Integrated Planning Act, so which has now become the Sustainable Planning Act. Um, and it was using a system, I'll explain in a moment, the regional ecosystem system. So this new framework came in, led to a huge amount of panic clearing. Um, it didn't actually commence until 2000. And then in 2004, the story goes, because there was ongoing controversy and a lot of clearing going on, and the story that was in the press was Peter Beattie had been out to a meeting in Ogothella, I'm not sure where he went out to, Barcaldon, and he was, the story goes that he was flying back and he looked out of the um, government jet and all across the horizon he could see um, fires burning with farmers like burning what they'd cleared. And he had this epiphany that, you know, they needed to um, basically phase out broad scale tree clearing. So Beattie brought in um, major reforms in 2004 um, for both, which merged the two different systems under the Lands Act and the Vegetation Management Act into one, but also then um, proposed a moratorium on tree clearing and a phase out where they would have a ballot to issue um, clearing permits to farmers and basically distribute um, a certain amount, allow a certain amount of more clearing for broad scale clearing for agriculture. And that um, ended um, at the end of 2006. So the broad scale clearing for agriculture was phased out. So a cattle property like Kaiba agriculture, um, you would not be allowed to clear it. And so where I dealt with Kyber was back in that final, that period 10 years ago, where we were, part, we were in the phase out and the farmer had applied for a permit to clear the land, actually under the old Lands Act system, and it needed to be resolved. The government had said no, and the farmer had appealed to the um, land court, and so went to trial, and um, we, well, we won the trial, so the landholder wasn't allowed to clear. So that's end of 2006, and then basically there's a few things done over the next um, few years with um, high value regrowth and the like, but um, it wasn't until 2013 when the LNP government had been elected where there was a reintroduction of broad scale clearing for um, some agriculture under the Vegetation Management Framework Amendment Bill, or Act, in 2013 was passed. So that was under the Newman government. So. Um, ups and downs, um, and it's reflected in the clearing. So um, this is clearing um, over the last you know, nearly 20 years. The black represents clearing of remnant vegetation. The red represents clearing of regrowth vegetation. So vegetation that had been previously cleared was regrowing and then is, is cleared. And then the total um, yeah, in those last couple of years don't split up the two different ones. So you can see this huge spike um, around 1999, 2000. That's when, when the VMA was brought in and farmers basically decided we've got to get in and clear because the government's going to take our right to clear. So there's a huge spike there and then you can see around 2003, 2004 um, where there's this also major change um, and then it starts to drop off in the phase out period but basically, yeah, the politics has driven huge spikes in, in tree clearing. And the, 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 these vegetation laws were incidentally one of the most important components of Australia meeting its climate change commitments under the Kyoto Protocol. Um, so Queensland phasing out broad scale clearing actually reduced Australia's overall emissions um, very significantly. You can see it drop away um, in 2007 um, through 2012 and then it comes back up in the Newman years when the government pretty well said we're not going to, A, we're not going to, they'd made an election promise that they would keep the vegetation framework so they couldn't, well they could have, they broke a lot of election promises but basically they kept it in name but they sent a clear message to the um, farming community that you'll never be prosecuted, we're not going to prosecute, they closed down prosecutions um, at a government level and so no one was being prosecuted and, and that spike coming back up reflects um, basically non-enforcement of the law. Um, so yeah, politics has been really significant in this. 
Um, so yeah, um, this is just a picture from 2013. Um, Campbell Newman has said, so this is 15th of March 2013, C Premier Campbell Newman has said that the greatest threat posed to enacting future reforms to vegetation management legislation is the Green Movement, <sighs> which he said has long been adept at hijacking public debate. Mr Newman said that while the government was on the um, side of the farmer, he called on the landholders across the state to stand up and become a more prominent voice against those radical environmentalist agendas. And we know that um, you know, Greens are overtaking the world and they're a terrible threat to democracy, so um, I can fully agree with everything that's said there, I'm sure. Um, so they proposed significant changes to the VMA regime um, and yet they kept some major components as well. Um, so they'd promised that they wouldn't junk the whole regime, um, so they kept the regional ecosystem um, system, and I'll go and explain what that is in a moment. Now, at the present time, you might have seen in the press, I've been posting a, um, um, some stories about it on the um, Blackboard site, but there's a, currently a public debate because the current Labor government has introduced an act to get rid of the Newman government's um, changes. So the Vegetation Management Reinstatement um, and Other Legislation Amendment Bill has, was introduced on the 17th of March. It's currently um, being debated. Uh, you'll see stuff about it in the press. As I said yesterday, the federal Labor government also announced it wanted to control vegetation clearing at a national level, but that's a separate, separate thing that's happening and be under the EPBC Act. So um, you can see just this article from um, 18th of March. Um, Deputy Premier Jackie Trad said the laws would close loopholes created by the Newman government um, and yeah, but the previous government had introduced a series of self-accessible codes for landholders to manage clearing on certain areas and Labor promised to tighten restrictions on the state, the state election. It's actually taken Labor quite a bit of time to get to this um, because they're in such a precarious position in Parliament and the Speaker, uh, um, the independent Peter Wellington, who they depend upon to get this legislation through, is umming and ahhing about what is the right way to go. So Labor hasn't just been able to pass amendments. Um, but anyway, it's pushing for them now. And th this is the, just the explanatory notes to the bill. Um, so the policy objectives of this new act are to reinstate a responsible vegetation management framework to more effectively manage vegetation clearing in Queensland, thereby reducing clearing rates and consequential carbon emissions, guard against excessive clearing of riparian vegetation, especially in the Great Barrier Reef catchments, uh, amend the Water Act to reinstate the application of riverine protection permit framework, so basically these were permits to clear within a water course, um, and amend also Environmental Offsets Act, so few acts. Okay, there's a whole range of useful information about this framework that exists. You can go on to um, the um, government website. Um, there's heaps of stuff about vegetation management in Queensland, and I want to unpack it. So if you look at the Vegetation Management Act, um, it defines vegetation as a native tree or plant other than the following, grass or non-woody herbage, so it's basically trees, um, a plant within a grassland regional community prescribed under regulation, so grassland regional ecosystems, and mangroves. Mangroves are excluded even though they're a woody tree because they're protected under the Fisheries Act, so they're protected under fisheries laws. So it's a bit of, just a little bit of a complication. They're protected as marine plants. Okay, so the whole system is integrated into um, the Sustainable Planning Act. So you can see here just a definition in the Sustainable Planning Act. Native vegetation means vegetation under the Vegetation Management Act, so it's a cross-reference. And then um, there's a series of categories. Remnant vegetation means vegetation, part of which forms the predominant canopy of the vegetation, covering more than 50% of the undisturbed predominant canopy and averaging more than 70% of the vegetation's undisturbed height and composed of species characteristic of the vegetation's undisturbed predominant canopy. So it's um, rather than just call it, say, an emotive term like old growth forest, the law in 2000 adopted a more scientific approach where it defined criteria for what was remnant vegetation and then the law focused on protecting remnant vegetation. Why do you think 
just from a practical regulatory perspective, why do you think you'd take this approach if you're the regulator? What's a big advantage of just having objective criteria like this where you really don't need to know the history of clearing on a property? You just have to be able to work out, does the vegetation meet these criteria? Can be fairly quick or the big advantage is that you can then map the whole of the state and if they meet these objective criteria, it's regarded as remnant vegetation. And you don't need to know if it was cleared in 1850 and has since regrown, doesn't matter for your purposes because um, it's, if it's back to 50% of the undisturbed um, canopy coverage and 70% of the undisturbed height, then you meet the criteria. And so a lot of the mapping that's been done of remnant vegetation is just from satellite imagery. So that can cover huge areas and the Queensland Herbarium's done a great job in basically mapping it. So that's remnant vegetation. And there's, um, you can find all these sorts of maps um, from the Queensland Herbarium. So pre-clearing and current remnant vegetation in Queensland. I know you can't really see, it might not look like much, but see here, and this is the current, see all these white areas? So all the white areas um, in sort of southeast and central Queensland are all areas that have been cleared, so non-remnant. And um, regrowth vegetation, just to contrast to remnant, remember we talked about pelican lynx, um, that person had gone in and, you know, cleared, or the company that had gone in and cleared. So, um, and remember that I said I'd been back to the site after the clearing. So in 2004, it was cleared. And then um, this next picture is taken where the red circle is. So um, I was there standing and I thought it was a really good example of regrowth. So basically the trees had gotten back um, in six years. It was basically at head height for me. And you can see that I was just on the edge of where the clearing had occurred. So you can see the taller trees over there to the right is probably remnant in that it probably meets the um, criteria, but certainly the stuff on the left doesn't is non-remnant. And that's regrowth. So it's actually regrowing, but it hasn't yet met the criteria for remnant. So on the site that you're developing, remember when we went there, um, a lot of it's covered in trees. But if you look at the vegetation mapping, it's all shown as um, non-remnant, it's all white, even though there's these big trees. So we know it was cleared in the 60s for agriculture and it doesn't meet the criteria for remnant vegetation. Um, here, so just an, 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 the next picture is basically showing this little section that I put in the box. So you can see the, let's call it remnant in the distance and the non-remnant in the foreground. And so basically, the herbarium, the Queensland Herbarium, prepared maps for the whole of Queensland where you can see these colour, um, that I've extracted a little bit from a map for this particular place. And the white here represents non-remnant vegetation. So you can see down here in the key, it's non-remnant. And then all the colours represent different regional ecosystems. And so, and that picture is right, pretty sure it was right, um, there, just basically on that margin. So um, I was standing in the white area and looking at remnant vegetation in the mid distance. Okay, so regional ecosystem maps are prepared. And a regional ecosystem means vegetation, a vegetation community in a bioregion that is consistently associated with a particular combination of geology, landform, and soil. So there's three components. In Queensland, it's RE is described with these three numbers. So, and you just you say it like RE 11.4.3. So 11 means the first number represents the bioregion, the second number represents the land zone, and the third number represents the vegetation community in that area. So, um, and there's 13 bioregions in Queensland. And then there's 12 land zones. So they go from, this is just land zone one, um, which is tidal flats and beaches. Um, 
and you can go online, you can get a more detailed definition, but these different land zones, everything from basically coastal lowlands through to mountainous sort of terrain, so they're the, that's the second part of the regional ecosystem description. And then you have the um, characteristic vegetation assemblages. Notice that there's no animals as part of this. It's the bioregion, land zone, and then plant community. So um, animals are not part of the RE system as such, um, but it's, and, and so the criticism about the RE system is that it doesn't reflect um, biodiversity um, well. But the reason it's been created is because we actually don't know, for a lot of animals, we don't really know their habitat requirements very well, particularly when they move around in different seasons. So by creating a system based on vegetation, which we can identify, it allows us to map what's there in the environment and basically identify things that um, form different habitats for animals, but the ARI system is focused on the plant communities. So this is a picture actually from um, the Kyber property. So the expert we had in the land court case back in 2005 went onto the property and he took pictures. So this is from Kyber. Um, and this is RE 11.4.3. Brigolo with false sandalwood, wilga and emergent black butt is just the short name. You can go and get a longer description of it. But yeah, that's the, um, yeah, the dominant vegetation assemblage. And so characteristic vegetation assemblages. And the Queensland Herbarium basically classified all these different um, assemblages. And yes, there's blurring around the edges, but basically um, they use this system to yeah, identify different, you can look at different systems and you, you look at them and think, oh yeah, that looks different. So this is 11.4.7, poplar box with groved brigolo, false sandalwood and scattered mulga. Um, and this is again on the Kyber property. And then this is RE 11.5.5, silver leaved ironbark woodland and acacia creza. And another one from the Kyber property, brigolo with bohemia and false sandalwood. So RE 11.9.11. .9 .11. And um, smooth barked apple, silver leaved, iron bark, and cypress pine in a broad sandy valley, so 11.10.6. Uh, and then RE 11.3.19, rough bark apple on a deep sandy flat associated with the Warrego River. So it sounds fairly exotic, doesn't it? So, and you can see it's very, they're very different regional ecosystems. They look very, look very different. And this is. Uh, RE 6.5.9, um, Mulga with emergent Carimbia clarksonia and Queensland peppermint. And um, you might just notice there's been a significant change there because we've just gone from RE's 11 to an RE with 6, so it's actually a different bioregion. Um, and you might say, well, how can that be on the same property that they're in different bioregions? And this property just happens to be right on the border between two bioregions, so the um, RE rules allow for um, basically a bit of a blur along the edge. It's not just a hard, you get to one point um, on a GPS and you change to an entire bioregion. There's a bit of blurring on the edges. So this property is right between two um, bioregions, but that's Mulga. Okay, so that's just different REs and there's, I'm not sure how many there are, if it's several hundred. Um, they're all listed in the regulations to the vegetation management regulations. And so what the Queensland Herbarium did was map all these REs, and let's just say there's 300 um, different REs. They mapped their extent across Queensland, and then they um, worked out how much of them were left. So um, if there was more than 30% left, they were classified as not of concern. If there was between um, 10 and 20, 10 and 30 percent, they were classified as of concern REs, and if there was less than 10 percent, they were classified as an endangered regional ecosystem. So basically, you, the idea is you look at what was there before, you look at how much is left, and if there's not much of it left, then it gets higher levels of protection. And the basic idea is protect bits, you know, protect a bit of everything. And the big thing that this is doing from a biodiversity perspective is it's creating a framework where you've got objective criteria, which sure isn't perfect. Um, it doesn't 
really cover animals very well, but because of our gaps in knowledge about what animals need, this system at least establishes a framework where you can look at what was there and then say, well, protect a bit of everything, because say a, a bird species flies around and uses different vegetation types in different seasons, and maybe just in a drought year goes to a particular vegetation assemblage um, and it only eats it in drought years. So it might only be there once every six years. But if it wasn't, you know, if you got rid of all of that vegetation in that drought year, the birds have nothing to eat, so they die. So protecting a bit of everything when we don't know what a lot of animals need for their habitat is really um, a risk management strategy, and that's what we've done. So it's, it's often seen as a surrogate for biodiversity conservation. Um, and the, the big advance that we've made with the RE system, you might get the idea that I'm a fan of the RE system. I think it's one of the best things we've done in Queensland. It's really cutting edge vegetation management for globally. The big thing that we've done is we've gone from a system which is, you know, we're used to, national parks um, are traditionally in beautiful, like, you know, rainforest with a waterfall or something like that. That's what we'd make national parks because people like to go there. It looks beautiful to us. And swamps and lowland, you know, melaleuca forests or something, which had lots of mosquitoes and the like, people tended to want to just clear and put farmland in, so, and they don't look beautiful to a lot of humans. So um, we didn't tend to protect those. And what this system is doing is moving us from just protecting the things that are beautiful to humans to having a system that, say, basically protect a bit of everything. Um, and um, that's then moving to a, a much better, more objective system for biodiversity conservation because, yeah, the swamp that has a lot of mosquitoes in it mightn't be, you know, I know my dad would just be, because, you know, North Queenslander, we would, my dad would have been, you know, bloody swamp should be cleared, drain it, put sugar cane on it. Um, and that would be a common attitude, but this system is about trying to make it um, a more comprehensive framework that actually um, tries to protect different, you know, the, the whole ecosystem, um, but it is imperfect. I don't doesn't matter to me because, you know, it's a surrogate, it's a lot better than, you know, you've got to have some objective criteria for what you protect, and this is trying to give that. Okay, so endangered regional ecosystems, um, yeah, it's basically if it's less than 10% of it left, um, or if it's a small RE um, and it's less than 10,000 hectares. Um, then there's of concern REs, 10 to 30 percent, or again, for small REs, there's other criteria, but basically you can think of concern, 10 to 30 percent, and then least concern, or it used to be called not of concern, mixing, might be mixing up threatened species list there. Anyway, least concern regional ecosystems, um, over 30 percent of it left. So um, then in the vegetation management regulations, there's um, these regional ecosystems are listed in each RE is listed in one of those um, classes. And so RE 11.4.3, Acacia harpophilia, um, et cetera, is listed as an endangered regional ecosystem, so there's less than 10% of it left. Um, so, yeah, basically Brigalobila um, scrub. And you can read a full description, but then if you look at Kaiba, you can map, if go back to Kaiba, you can map um, the regional ecosystems and um, the white is all the non-remnant. And remember when we looked at the um, Google Earth images, we saw all of that was cleared, and then there was these little patches around. And then um, basically they take the different REs and then they've imposed a color if it's um, remnant vegetation that is least concerned um, regional ecosystem is that aqua green. And then the pink is um, dominant um, remnant um, uh, endangered regional ecosystems. And there's actually a number of endangered REs there, but basically that big pink area. And so in the court case, we had a big fight over what were the correct classifications of those REs, and it made a big difference on whether they were endangered or um, least concern. So um, you can get these maps for free. You, you might have done it in last week's tutorial. 
just gone on, one of the components I said was go to the um, website down and just order the RE map for the land and you would have gotten back that most of the land that we're developing is white, it's non-remnant. So that's been available since the system came in. You could go online and just basically request a map and it would generate it for free. And so this freely available mapping um, has been really important for the success of this system because it's allowed people to easily access the data. Um, contrast that to some other systems like at a Commonwealth level, there are endangered regional ecosystems, but you can't, you can't get any maps of them. And basically no one really ever pays attention to them because you can't get data on them. So um, it's a, yeah, much less practical. So making information readily available is, is important in practice. So is the proposed clearing of vegetation on Kaiba lawful? If not, what steps need to be taken to make it lawful? So um, under the sustainable planning regulations, there's a prohibited development. It's uh, accessible development is prohibited, sorry. Clearing of native vegetation is prohibited unless it's for a relevant purpose listed under the Act. And then um, the Vegetation Management Act lists um, a range of relevant purposes, so if you are um, clearing for a significant project or coordinated project under the State Development Public Works Organisation Act, or it's necessary to ensure public safety, or for a necessary fence, fire break road or vehicular track, all of those things are relevant purposes, you can apply to clear them. Um, and then going to the sustainable planning regulations, there's a big tables for um, triggers for accessible development. Um, so operational works that's the clearing of native vegetation on freehold land, etc. Um, and then basically it links to a whole range of exemptions where you don't need um, to apply. So um, Schedule 24, um, there's things that are exempt from needing approval and it's basically things like fire breaks, um, um, you know, if, you, if a tree is like going to fall on a house, you can get in and chop it down because it's a danger to public safety. But you, know, that you can't go and clear 2,000 hectares and claim it's a danger to public safety. But you know, if that, it's, a, it's a practical system. There's a whole range of exemptions for clearing along fence lines, clearing for fire breaks. You're allowed to do, you don't need any approval for. There's a big long list of them in Schedule 24 of the Sustainable Planning Regulations. And um, yeah, things like routine management, um, it's quite detailed um, and it it's, um, yeah, gives a lot of certainty if you can understand it, um, but um, yeah, it's complex. Um, so Schedule 24, clearing of veg native vegetation, um, not accessible on different um, uh, tenures, so leasehold land. Um, so our land, Kaiba, is leasehold land. Um, and we could go through all the categories of what's exempt. And if we wanted to clear that 2,700 hectares, we'd find that it doesn't meet any of the criteria for being exempt. So we are, we are wanting to carry out accessible development. Um, you could go through some of the exemptions for things like essential management, means clearing native vegetation to establish a necessary fire break, um, et cetera. So there's all these exemptions for clearing vegetation, but they wouldn't allow what's proposed in Kyber of clearing 2,700 hectares for essentially to make um, more paddocks for cattle. Um, big definitions for routine management. So a lot of vegetation clearing can be carried out under these exemptions but they wouldn't apply to Kaiba. Then um, the Newman LNP government um, changed the vegetation management framework in 2012 and they, they brought back in um, allowing clearing for broad scale agriculture, which wasn't one of the um, permitted purposes before. And um, they brought in three categories that um, it was necessary for environmental clearing or it was for high value agricultural clearing or for irrigated high value agricultural clearing. Um, it also allowed for relevant infrastructure clearing for roads and the like. Um, so for things like um, uh, clearing for um, the coal seam gas um, development, all of those things are 
one of the um, permitted purposes under the um, vegetation management regime, but they're also dealt with under the mining and petroleum framework, which has basically allowed a whole wave of clearing um, in the last decade. So the, the phase out of broad scale clearing didn't end clearing in Queensland. It shifted though um, what was being cleared. So um, the Newman amendments um, allowed clearing for necessary environmental clearing was one example, but if you think about our Kyber property, we're not doing necessary environmental clearing. We want to clear it for pastoral, for cattle. Um, it also allowed clearing for high value agriculture and irrigated high value agriculture. And on the face of it, you wouldn't think that ours met at either of those because um, high value agriculture means clearing carried out to establish, cultivate and harvest crops other than clearing for grazing activities or plantation forestry. So clearing on Kyber for cattle, 2,700 hectares, wouldn't be for high value agriculture. Um, and it also wouldn't come within irrigated high value agriculture because we're not planning to irrigate it. So even under the Newman amendments, what we're proposing to do or what's proposed to do on Kyber still wouldn't be allowed to even be applied for. It would still be prohibited development. Um, so there were new categories for relevant purposes were in, in, inserted into the Veg Management Act regime. So the practical effect of allowing clearing of remnant um, vegetation to, for crops and irrigated agriculture, I thought at the time was likely to be limited by the fact that most suitable land for those uses had already been cleared. So this was, um, you know, this is a picture of the Tully floodplain, sort of North Queensland where I'm from. And if you look at it, most of the land has already been cleared. So um, the veg management laws didn't stop you, you know, if, you'd, if it had been cleared in the 1960s and you had a sugarcane farm on it, you could continue to grow sugarcane on it. The Veg Management Act didn't stop you. So a lot of these areas that were you'd think were high value agriculture or suitable for irrigated agriculture had already been cleared. So I thought, I wonder what practical effect it was going to have. Um, so Tully, the Tully floodplain, which is shown there, has all been cleared. Um, all the stuff that's green is all the um, highlands, which basically can't grow sugarcane on, which is why it hasn't been cleared. Um, but I didn't realise at the time, but basically they were used for sham applications. Um, so there's this, you see in the news, there's this um, um, Strathmore, um, the range of clearing that occurred um, up in Cape York and Strathmore Station, where 28,000 hectares of vegetation was cleared for high value agriculture, but it's really a pastoral property. And basically what the LMP did was create really loose criteria for what was high value agriculture and basically you could walk around and just throw out a few sorghum seeds and, gr and let them grow up and then let your cattle eat them and it came under the definition of high value agriculture. So if we were, if we were advising the landholder for um, Kyber, you'd say don't apply just saying you're going to grow cattle, say that you're going to basically put crops in. And you could make a sham application under the LNP, um, and that's what was done. There were sham applications that were really were for broad scale clearing for cattle, but they were they put them in under as high value agriculture, and the government approved them. This is the Strathmore was approved just before the LNP lost power. It's criminal what occurred. It should be basically dealt with as corruption because it was just appalling. But anyway, it got through, and it. Um, yeah, Strathmore basically got in and cleared like crazy and, and pulled down um, a huge amount of vegetation. So yeah, uh, and there's a lot of stories about this. This is from May last year. Um, Queensland government under pressure to stop heritage value um, bushland clearing in Cape York. Um, this was the Strathmore station, so very controversial. Um, and I just didn't realise at the time that it, they were going to be used in this way, but that's what happened. So there was a surge of land clearing um, since 2013. And basically the government created a whole range of self-assessable codes where landholders could just go in. They also flagged, we're not going to enforce the law. So yeah, we've had the surge of land clearing and we're trying to rein that in now and you'll see it in the news, it's still really controversial. Yeah, got a question? Oh, it was just like, so when you changed the act, you were allowed to change definitions of words at the same time, but how it worked, is that what you Yeah, basically there was a lot of changes that were made 
Um, and yeah, they brought in, it was sort of insidious because they kept the framework because they had made an election problem, promise that they wouldn't, um, they wouldn't, they would keep the vegetation management framework. So they kept it, the shell, and then they gutted it. And they also said, clearly indicated they weren't going to enforce it. So they claimed that they had complied with their election promise while also, it's sort of like the um, Boyle approach to, you know, yes, give the land, but gut it, you know, strip all the trees out before it goes to the National Park. Very similar attitude. Okay, my evaluation of those 2013 changes is just here. Basically, I had thought there were some good things in it. Um, it was three steps um, forward and two steps back under the vegetation management laws. There were some good things in it, but I just didn't realise at the time that it was going to be used for sham applications. And basically, yeah, it, it actually, there were major impacts that it had. Um, so that's trying to be unpicked at present. It's still politically controversial. It's uncertain whether we'll get through. Obviously, the Queensland government's not very strong. Yep, you've yeah, got a question, I, Alexandra? Can I mention that um, actually, they're actually taking public submissions in support of um, Labor-type negotiations with Labor and Yep, Labor. great. Yeah, so there's public submissions at present. And they're ending Friday. So they end Friday, so yeah. get in and if you feel passionate about it, put a submission in. Yeah, it's really important. Yep, great. So land clearing rates have tripled to put in a submission. Yeah, I've got a question. Um, what are the main criticisms of the minority, sorry, the minority government's amendments? Are they both the first year and they'll be applied retrospectively? Um, to a lay person, that seems to be very critical. We think the other things are based on. Yeah, that's a great question. So can I just summarise it? So one of the criticisms is that they return to reversing the onus of proof. I actually fully agree with the reversal of the onus of proof in this case. So normally, um, if you're charged with a criminal offence, the Crown has to prove all of the elements of the offence against you that say you're in possession of drugs and etc. And you know they have to prove that you know all of the elements. Um, for these offences, um, if clearing occurs, then it's presumed that the landholder was the person that carried it out, and they have to, unless they prove otherwise. And in practice. No one clears a thousand hectares of land just by accident. And the problem is that they occur in remote areas. And if no one talks to you, like if you find it out that the clearings occurred from satellite imagery and you go out and no one talks to you, if you have to prove who did it, then it can be impossible. But it's clear that the landholder would have authorised it because, you know, like you had that comment from um, Boyle that it would cost him $100,000 to do that clearing. It's expensive to do this. No one just has, you know, these bulldozers running around. Um, by accident. So reversing the onus of proof, landholders know their land. It doesn't happen by accident. So I personally am fully in favour of the reversal of the onus of proof in this circumstance. What about the laws being replied retrospectively? Um, so I think, I personally think there was a lot of dodgy stuff done um, during that period and I personally am, am in favour of um, the changes that are proposed. But, you know, you can have a different view. Make a submission on that aspect of it. Hey, I am going to wrap up because I know there's another class um, and I've only got a couple of um, things. So, in summary, to answer our main questions, the clearing in the National Park was unlawful under Section 62. You couldn't have applied for it, you wouldn't have gotten approval. The proposed clearing on Kaiba would be unlawful without approval as it's accessible development under SPA, but it cannot be applied for as it's not a relevant purpose, even under the new system. You could possibly do a sham application and say you're going to spread around some crops. Um, so, in summary, we've looked at these two problems um, and gone through the Nature Conservation Act and Veg Management Act. The main thing I want you to be aware of is the RE system and just those three components. Um, and yeah, you can read the, the entry for the VMA in my synopsis book. It's got a summary of that. So take home points. Nature conservation and vegetation management are regulated under many acts, not simply the Nature Conservation Act and VMA. The Nature Conservation Act protects everything within national parks and protected wildlife outside of protected areas. Um, the VMA creates one of the most scientifically advanced environmental regulatory systems in the world based on the RE system. And broad scale clearing of remnant vegetation for agriculture was banned in Queensland at the end of 2006. Um, but there's been you know, ongoing controversy about that. Okay, that's the lecture. Thanks, guys, and I'll see you next week.